Let me now invite another longtime Thai volunteer and past Daikon convener, Ravinder Paul Singh, to introduce the closing grand keynote speakers. R. Paul Singh is a serial entrepreneur with four successful exits and one company going public. Paul is currently the CRO of Tada Cognitive and an adjunct professor of entrepreneurship at UC Berkeley and Northeastern University. He has served on Thai Silicon Valley board for a number of years. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Anand. Um, so I'm here to introduce the next session um, with Coinbase, which is going to be introduced uh, by uh, none other than Gokul Rajaram. And I had the privilege of uh, having Gokul Rajaram as one of our investors in a startup, which, uh, and he has been investing in many successful startups. And he's also, Gokul is an executive uh, at uh, DoorDash. In addition to that, he's on the board of Coinbase, uh, as well as uh, Pinterest and many other high-tech companies. So let me bring on Gokul Rajaram. Thank you, Paul. It's great to be here. And it's my pleasure to introduce a closing fireside chat with Coinbase, a company I was excited to join the board of last year. It wasn't that long ago that most people hadn't heard of crypto or Bitcoin or thought it was perhaps a fringe technology or a passing fad. 12 years after Bitcoin was created, Coinbase, as the leading crypto exchange, recently had one of the largest public offerings ever and is now listed on the NASDAQ. Crypto first started with Bitcoin and now there are thousands of crypto assets. Similarly, Coinbase started as a place where you could buy and sell Bitcoin and now offers its 56 million customers the opportunity to buy and sell many types of crypto, in addition to the ability to send, save, borrow, and lend, all with crypto. And now we have people spending $69 million to acquire a unique piece of digital art made possible by NFTs, a crypto technology. This is just the beginning and Coinbase is at the center of it. With us today, we have two key Coinbase executives, Surajit Chatterjee and Paul Graval. To stay on the leading edge of innovation, Coinbase brought on Surajit Chatterjee as chief product officer early last year. Surajit joined from Google, where he was VP of product for Google Shopping. I had the distinct pleasure of working with Surajit at Google. Prior to that, he led product for Flipkart in India. Paul Graval joined Coinbase from Facebook, where he was deputy general counsel. And believe it or not, I also worked with Paul and had a great time working with them at Facebook. Prior to that, Paul served as a US magistrate judge for the Northern District of California. As chief legal officer, Paul ensures that Coinbase remains the most trusted crypto exchange. With that, I'll hand it off to Surajit and Paul for a conversation around why they made the move to crypto, how crypto is being adopted across the globe, and what's in store for the future of the space. Thank you. Thank you, Gokul, for that very kind introduction. And thank you to Taikon and especially Vish Mishra for, for inviting Surajit and I to, to be a part of this. Um, as someone who's been a, a big fan of Thai for many years, attended many events here in the Silicon Valley, going back to the earliest days, it's just a real, real honor to be uh, asked to, to, uh, to be a part of this uh, conversation and to help close things out after a very exciting couple of days. Uh, Surajit? It's always good to see you. This is a lot like our weekly one-on-ones, just with a few thousand more people listening in and watching in. Um, why don't we dive right in? All right, let's do it. Very excited. Excellent. I'm excited too. So, so Sarajit, as, as somebody who's had uh, just a tremendous career working at some of the world's leading technology companies, someone who's worked on all kinds of different products from online ads to e-commerce and the like, what made you make the leap into what is, I think, a less established world of crypto here at Coinbase? Uh, great question, Paul. Let me actually tell you a quick story, if I may. I was head of product at Flipkart in India at that time. And one evening in November, I think, uh, 2016, government just announced a demonetization. And 80% of Flipkart's business was cash and delivery. So you can, as you can imagine, Next day, our business just tanked. But wow. it kind of, but it was not just the business. 
it kind of hit home for me even more when I heard my eight year old dad had to wait for five hours in a line to get 2000 rupees. That's the maximum amount he could get a new currency out of his own bank account. He had no choice because, you know, as you know, India is a cash on mostly cash economy. And that's what got me to dig into kind of do my own research into crypto. And I bought my first Bitcoin a few weeks after that. And, you know, fast forward a few years when Brian started talking to me about uh, Coinbase and the opportunity. And I just felt like I could not pass on this, uh, this chance. And in, in my career, I have always done things that I viscerally kind of felt that had the potential to change the world. And it, was, it started with working on Google mobile ads, which I believe democratized advertising. Flipkart, it was about revolutionizing how a billion people shop. And crypto and Coinbase is about redefining money and, and how we use the entire financial system. So that's, that's my story. But you know, you you also spent a long time at Facebook. I did. What 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 got you here in crypto? Well, I was at Facebook for uh, almost five years, and uh, before that, I was a I was a judge at, in the federal district courthouse here in Silicon Valley, as, as Gokul alluded to. And um, you know, for me, Surajit, um, in my career, I've always tried to focus on you know where the law was headed, as opposed to where it. It happened to be at the time. That's why when I started out, you know, the, the most important case I worked on as a young lawyer was the Sun uh, antitrust lawsuit against Microsoft in the late 90s. And as a judge, I had a chance to work on some fairly significant technology cases, Apple versus Samsung, Oracle versus Google. And so when I returned to private life and private practice, it was very important to me uh, to continue to get to work on issues that would uh, help define the law for years to come and not just you know cases that would settle a particular dispute between particular parties. Crypto, frankly, checked all of those boxes for me. The technology was, was, was very much bleeding edge. Um, the law around crypto, uh, while it's taking shape, is still very much to be set and defined, I think, in the years to come. Um, and, and for me personally, you know, a huge part of the attraction to coming to Coinbase was the chance to once again work with tremendous people, not only with, with tremendous talent, but also tremendous character. And so it was, uh, in the end, something I couldn't say no to any more than you could. And I'm glad you, you joined us. It's been great. Well, I'm glad I'm here to too. I'm glad I'm here too. <laughs> I, could not have, I could not have foreseen all that we get to work on in just these last seven or eight months. So, so Surajit, in terms of uh, you know all that we're working on uh, today and what we're seeing in the crypto landscape, I'd love to understand better from you where you think uh, the crypto economy is today and where you think it might be headed. Yeah, you know, there are many ways to think about it. I think about crypto as kind of three stages of crypto, and it started with you know with my story at that time, crypto as money, right? It's a universal kind of store of value. People call it digital gold. And it basically it make, made money and payments kind of universally accessible. And this is what started all the exchanges and brokerages um, in the world, including Coinbase being one of the leading ones. I think the next phase of crypto is crypto as a financial system. And I think this started with Ethereum coming in, which allowed anyone to basically build the smart contracts and deploy and create in interesting financial products that anybody in the world can ac access uh, just with an internet connection and mobile phone. So that's, that kind of is going to, I think, change how we think about financial services and how we use financial services. It, imagine like savings, loan, trading, insurance, anything you can think of right? accessible to anyone in the world with a smartphone and internet connection, extremely powerful concept. And we are seeing the beginning of, the, of this revolution with decentralized finance or DeFi, already almost $60 billion of value locked in DeFi in just a matter of a couple of years now. And the third phase, I think, which we are getting into or will get into very soon, is I think crypto as a, as a platform. So it's not just a 
not crypto not just redefining money but redefining information you know you're already seeing this with for example nft technology it's just disrupting media and disrupting ownership of content and, and art and so forth so we'll see that crypto is going to help us reimagine the internet as a whole it would make it less centralized and create better incentives for everyone who participates and contributes so maybe less ads the you and I both come from yes. companies that made a lot of money using advertising, but maybe create a better incentive model uh, for compensating original creators on the internet. Uh, and I think that will be best, great for everyone. So that's that's how I think about it. And it's it's also interesting that all three phases are kind of it's it's not it's completely over. There's a lot of experimentation still being done on crypto as money and payments, crypto as financial system is getting started and crypto as platform is also getting started kind of in power. So it's not that we have to wait for one phase to be over for the next phase to begin. Uh, absolutely. We are seeing this cascading kind of uh, arrows of, of innovation in, in each phase. And there are multi-trillion dollars of companies, market cap companies will be created uh, in 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 the next decade or so, on on all of these kind of uh, concepts. Yeah, you know it's interesting, Serge. It, um, as I think about the first phase, as as you described it, it the the focus has at least initially been very much on the retail customer, uh, the individual in India, you know, looking at his parent um, you know, struggling to get cash out of a bank, um, the you know, small business. You know, for example, thinking about how to accept payments, those sorts of things. Recently, there's just been uh, a, a lot of excitement about institutional interest as well, right? We're, we're seeing just tremendous um, excitement and investment by companies like MicroStrategy, Tesla, a number of others that are looking to put Bitcoin on their balance sheet and into their corporate treasury. Um, from your perspective, what's driving that trend? Yeah, it's it's been exciting to see all the institutional interest in crypto. I think two things come to my mind. First, we have seen institutional investors, influential institutional investors are really standing behind crypto as a new asset class now. I mean, for example, Paul Tudor Jones wrote this uh, analysis of Bitcoin as a store of value. Traditional asset managers like Ruffer or One River, like big names, Right. They are buying into Bitcoin, you know, MicroStrategy you mentioned, Tesla recently, and, and every corporation today is calling us or somebody else to, to think about how to put some portion of their treasury into crypto. I think the second reason is, and the reason probably, the real reason why everyone is doing that, I think is that governments around the world have printed a ton of money to support their economies during the pandemic. Worry about inflation of fiat currencies and uh, institutional investors are looking at, crypt at crypto in a way to diversify their exposure. Would you, uh, would, would, would you say that this institutional interest has really been focused in uh, countries like the United States or, or do you think this is a more global, global phenomenon going forward? We are seeing a global trend here. We're seeing in every country, institutional investors are excited about crypto, family offices are calling us, um, large hedge funds, pension funds, endowment funds, you name it. We, we are seeing massive interest in uh, crypto from everybody. Thinking about uh, institutional interest and, and international interest in crypto, you know, we, we, we tended to focus on uh, the, the private sector, but there's a lot of public institutional interest in crypto as well. And I, I have to ask this being Taikon, at least one question about China. Um, it seems that the Chinese have, have really embraced crypto in a very unique way. There, there's massive development of central bank digital currency uh, in China. There's just been heavy promotion of Bitcoin mining, for example. And all this is happening when other countries, uh, including India, have been a bit more reluctant or reticent to to get into to get into crypto with with both feet. How do you think about that um, that that disparity or that difference between uh, these countries in terms of their appetite for crypto and their and their eagerness to to fully embrace it? 
Yeah, great question. Uh, to start with, I, I think that we have always seen there is apprehension about new technology. Uh, new technology is scary to, to lots of governments uh, because you know it can create new ways to circumvent existing laws of the land. Uh, same thing happened with the internet, mobile phone, e-commerce, and the way governments across the world dealt with that is not by not banning the technology, but by passing re new regulation that adapted to the technology. And China, as you said, has done this very well. They're ahead of everybody else on crypto. They've digitized their currency. They're running a bunch of tests with their citizens. I'm hoping uh, India and others follow the Chinese China's footsteps because digitizing a currency can actually give you an edge over everybody else because it just makes your entire financial system a lot more efficient. Uh, if we look at India, I think in the last 20 years or so, India has really embraced technology. And in fact, I would say India is leading the world in, in terms of creating an efficient payment network in the form of UPI. So uh, India also has the world's second largest number of mobile internet subscribers. So I'm actually super hopeful that India will adopt very reasonable regulation around cryptocurrencies and will very soon uh, research uh, building its own crypto uh, uh, digital currency. Yeah, I'm I'm very hopeful about 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 the future as well in India and in other countries that are now really seriously looking at crypto and the relationship to it. It's hardly an informal, uh, or rather, it's hardly a formal uh, index or measure, surge of demand or interest. But I, I have to share with you that um, I, from time to time, I look at the DMs I receive in my LinkedIn account, um, and uh, I can't help but observe that three countries account for the vast majority of inbound I get asking about crypto and opportunities in the space. India is one of those three. You, know, you want to guess what the other two are? U.S. and China. Chinese students studying internationally are, are number two. The number one uh, inbound country I, I receive uh, questions about come from Nigeria, of all places. So I think there are some very interesting developing markets out there that um, are really are being are, are, are being are, are, are being um, uh, bit by the crypto bug in a way that uh, isn't always appreciated. Uh, you know, I, I also have to comment, Surajit, just on, on regulation and um, how these different countries are thinking about it. There's just no question about it. Um, there's more activity now happening when it comes to regulation and in some cases legislation around the world than ever before. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm for one a long term optimist, even if I think in the short and perhaps medium term, we're going to face some serious headwinds, um, whether it's you know, on uh, issues like self-hosted wallets, as we've seen here in the United States, where the, the, the U.S. Treasury uh, promulgated a very controversial proposed rule at the end of last year about what data um, intermediaries uh, have to collect, not only about their own users, but their users' counterparties. Um, there's just, I think, a, a, a lot of regulatory momentum gathering around issues regarding KYC and, and other AML issues that, you know, really, I think will fundamentally define, you know, the type of information we have to gather about our, about our customers and our, our means for verification of those users. And I also think that there is just, again, or continues to be tremendous uncertainty around the nature of crypto assets under the, 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 the laws generally, and in particular, whether you know, certain crypto assets qualify as securities that are subject to a much more burdensome uh, regime. So uh, one of the one of the things I, I am very certain of is that my team and uh, and I will be very busy in the next few years here at Coinbase uh, trying to trying to nail down exactly what the rules of the road are and how we can best comply with them. Let me let me ask you, Surajit, uh, I'd be curious about uh, how you're thinking about the crypto market more broadly. Um, I've alluded to the fact that there are now you know, more crypto assets coming online than ever before. We're seeing things like NFTs um, really take root in the popular culture in a way that uh, I don't think any of us could have predicted even a short while ago. 
um, you're the you're the person in charge here at Coinbase uh, for for driving product innovation and thinking about the future. Um, how are you thinking about uh, innovation in, in a time when so much seems to be happening all at once? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you know, if you look at the crypto economy today, I think we have probably only seen one percent of what is possible. Right, and if you are in such a market you kind of quickly realize that the only way to stay ahead of the market is innovate faster than anybody else. And you cannot just rely on say managers or leaders to innovate. You need your whole company to innovate. And in fact, I believe best ideas often come from people who are closest to customers. Of course, you have to try a lot of ideas, but you also have to have, have much higher risk tolerance because a lot of those ideas will fail. And you have to take that uh, and sometimes even welcome that and keep encouraging people to try out new ideas. It's a little scary though, isn't it? Because you know that most of these projects are not going to succeed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, recently we launched a new program called Project 10%. So as you know, we follow like a 70-20-10 rule, which is followed by Google and others. You should explain to, 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 to folks who are less familiar, Serge, how does that 70-20-10 work? Yeah, so 70-20-10 rule means uh, we put 70% of our resources on our core projects, uh, business critical products, 20% on adjacent or strategic projects, and then we keep 10% of our resources in reserve for disruptive, disruptive ideas. So, uh, and the way we do this is anyone in the company can submit a two-page idea template and a bunch of folks sit around and decide uh, which ideas to, to choose. It's almost like how Y Combinator or incubators do this. So there are, we have pitch days and so forth. And once an idea is chosen, you're given a small incubation team to build on the idea. So Paul, if you have some cool idea, we'll give you like a five people engineering team to just go and build it and launch it and see what happens. It's every uh, chief legal officer's dream to have an eng team reporting to him. This may be my shot, Serge, so I'll have to make sure I spend some time thinking about the future even as we're wrestling with all these regulatory issues. Who knows? You, you may create the next billion dollar business. <laughs> I would love to see that happen. Uh, well, We've talked about India a bit, but uh, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about Coinbase's plans for a technology hub in India. And um, you know, putting it into the context of our of our overall philosophy of being a remote first company, what's your strategy and what's what's our plan for tapping into that talent in that market? Yeah, I, I, let me talk about crypto a little bit. You know, one of the core values of crypto is decentralization. And unlike the internet industry, which mostly got created in the Silicon Valley first and then proliferated over everywhere, crypto companies are not concentrated in the, in the valley. In fact, we find good crypto talents in unexpected places. I mean, you mentioned Nigeria. We actually find a lot of interest in crypto, for example, in Latin American countries, yes. Venezuela and uh, Argentina or Mexico. India is, a, is another place where we find a lot of great crypto talent coming up. So our strategy is go for the talent wherever they are and kind of decentralize our entire organization. So we are setting up this office in India to tap into all this uh, crypto uh, forward engineers who are already there, already doing great work. We are also, it's not just India, we are also hiring in Canada, Europe, Japan, Singapore, and looking at ways to extend into LATAM as well. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting, uh, Surajit, that even just a short while ago, so much great talent, if it wanted to realize its full potential, had to move where the companies are. It seems like now companies like Coinbase are moving to where the talent is, and those roles have been reversed. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I think one of the side effects of this pandemic has been that it, it taught us all how to run a company without ever leaving our homes. Uh, and we think you know, that model can extend across geographies now. And a lot of companies are doing the same thing. But I think we are 
we, we have taken a lead in, in uh, decentralizing our company early on. Yeah, it, it's, it, it, it seems very natural for a, 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 a company like Coinbase that has built so much of its foundation on decentralization um, to embrace a, a decentralized workforce in a way that has never been tried before. Yeah, it'll be a fun new experiment in how to run a global company. Well, like most fun new experiments, none of us know exactly how this will all turn out, but uh, Surjit, I'm, I'm just uh, delighted that I get to find out the answer to all these questions working alongside of you as a partner. It's been a, a wonderful opportunity and experience so far, and I look forward to many, many years together. Absolutely. Likewise. Thank you, Surajit and Paul. Really appreciate you taking the time to share your wisdom about Coinbase.